So that's a good illustration. Now, um, what is it? I have to ask you this question because I, I know people in the audience are going to be wondering it. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it like being a woman who is a biblical scholar? Um, you know, because the look, well, let's be. I, I in my sort of you know spiritual journey, I have been in contexts that look at this dramatically, you know, just diametrically opposite mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. There are con. I, I'm not going to name the institution, but I was at an institution uh, at one point that. Well, we had a professor, this wasn't the opinion across the board, but but we had a professor that would, you know, say things like, you shouldn't buy books and even read them, like commentaries, if they're by a woman, because women aren't supposed to be doing this. Wow. That's, that, that's the most extreme I can pluck out of my wow. own experience. And then you have yeah. the other, you know, and, and I had some of those books. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. you're crazy, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, this is a really good stuff. Um, but uh, I, I say I'm thinking like of Joyce Baldwin, you know, her Tyndale, okay. you know, I mean, come on, like, really? <laughs> uh, so but then they had the other, you know, other side of it where it's like, I can't even believe we're having this discussion, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So yep. what has the experience been like uh, for you? Good, yeah. bad, pushback, you know, encouragement. Yeah. You probably got, it's probably all the above, but go ahead. Yeah, you know, it is, it's been an interesting journey, but I will say it's a great time to be a woman Bible scholar. It is, we are in a great moment, I think, as a culture. Um, there are still people who are loudly pushing back, but they are slowly dying off. Can I say that? <laughs> That, um, well, that's you're allowed to say that because that's generational language. Yeah, yeah. it's a generational. That generation is passing away now. There are there are young people who are still passionate about women remaining silent and not teaching, but um, but there are I think, on the flip side, an increasing number of churches, schools, institutions who are saying, not only is it okay. But we actually want to have women here. We want women's voices to be part of the conversation. We're realizing what we've missed, only listening to people who look like us or who share our same gender. You know, if everything we learn is from someone just like us, then we end up with a, with a one-sided perspective. And so I, as, as I look around, I see publishers saying, we want to publish more women. And even publishers saying, no, we won't publish that collection of essays unless you include women's voices in it. So it's a day in which it's a great time to be a woman scholar because your work, yeah, your work because is just, you know, more yeah, accessible. It's, yeah, just well, it's definition. falling in my opportunities are falling in my lap because, because there's such a growing realization that we we need women's voices. It's not a matter of being politically correct. It's a matter of hearing from the whole church and, and recognizing scripture's vision for partnership between men and women. So I've had a really wonderful experience at Prairie College is so supportive. I've had almost no pushback here. When I interviewed, I said, how would the constituency feel about a woman teaching Bible here? And they said, well, let me put it this way. In 1922, our school was founded, and I think we hired our first woman Bible teacher in 1923. Hmm. So women have been teaching Bible here since 1923, um, and so the prairie is a little, you know, the Canadian scene is a little bit different than the scene in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's had a long history of affirming the giftedness of women and what they have to offer to the church. You know, I I remember again this this particular person I'm thinking of about don't don't read Joyce Baldwin's commentaries yeah. because it's yeah. Joyce Baldwin. You know, th that was uh, 30 years ago. But I, I remember even thinking then it's like, look, you know, e even if and, and I'll, I'll say this to, to people in, in our audience here, even if you don't, you know, endorse, you know, women's ordination, all the world is not a church. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the a, a Bible college is not a church, you know, right. so why? What's the deal here? But again, yeah. this yeah. I use that example because that's the most extreme mm -hmm. in, 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 in my experience that, yeah. you know, of, of telling us, just put down that wonderful commentary. Yeah. We'll yeah. It again. You, well, know? Wait, you know, for it me, the biggest, so the biggest pushback I had um, was when I was in Bible college myself and a professor of mine said, Carmen, I've noticed you in class. I wonder if you would consider being a lab instructor for me uh, for Bible study methods. So that would be that would mean doing, you know, 
twice a week, have a class, hold class for an hour with a smaller mm-hmm. group of students and actually be teaching them Bible content. And I said, is that okay? I mean, the pushback was me. Um, I had not grown up in a context where that was allowed. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, that sounds like a dream, but I don't think the Bible allows it. Like, how do you get to the place where you, you're you okay with allowing women to teach? And so he sat me down and took me through the the key passages and showed me how he read them. And I went, oh, this is a lot more complex than I thought. It's not just a matter of women being silent, because here's here Paul is telling women to wear head coverings when they pray or prophesy in yeah, public. when they pray or prophesy so in public. So they're actually speaking up in public in in a spiritually significant way in the life of the church. So maybe what I understood from these passages is not the whole story. So I began teaching under him, and and I remember that first couple of semesters as I was teaching Bible study methods, again, this is more than 20 years ago, um, I remember some pushback from students, like male students who were older, married, um, wouldn't even look me in the eye as I taught. They just, you know, this one guy would just stare down at the table and wouldn't even look up at me the whole class period. And I I went to my mentor and I said, what do I do? He said, don't give it another thought. Just do your work and do it with excellence, as I know you will, and he'll come around. And sure enough, by the end of the semester, he was telling all his friends to sign up for my class, and his wife signed up for it that next term. And so I learned then, like, not to go out and try to persuade people that I should be allowed to teach. Just take the opportunity. You don't don't need to be an activist. Right. Just Just do it well, and people will realize, oh, that was edifying, and I learned a lot. (laughs) I want to learn more. Yeah, the the I'm glad you used the edification word because, uh, again, I can remember instances in my own uh, context where when you start thinking about the passages, and again, you know, obviously all the world is not a church and all all that stuff, but when you start asking yourself legitimate questions like, okay, we're not in a church, we're in this class or whatever, and I was just, I was blessed, you know, (laughs) by by what this this woman in front, you know, I I remember in college, you know, we we had a psychology teacher who had had a long history of of, uh, missions experience. And she you know, she would just say things that it's like, I mean, I, I still remember this is the woman who this is the first time I heard five minutes is a long time, hmm. you know, and because I was, I always had to work through school and, you know, do this or that. And it's like, that has just, that just stuck with me. Hmm. For the, the moment I heard it, that's like just ingrained in, in my character now, you know, and, hmm. but I mean, but she would, she would just have really good, you know, scriptural principle kinds of conversations with the class Mm -hmm. uh, during the class. And it's like, you know, God forbid that I should be encouraged or edified in any way, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but when you start thinking about it, like in terms of the biblical language, it's like, yeah, I was, you know, is there something wrong? You know, I mean, it, it starts to just get you to think about the coherence of, of one particular approach to what, what really is a, a, it's quite a complex issue. Years yeah. ago on, on the blog, and I, uh, I I had a conversation. I don't know if you know John Hobbins. Yes, I uh, do. Yeah, he and his wife, you know, were, were both, uh, you know, ministers in Wisconsin. I, I knew John right. from, from the UW. But we, we we did this back and forth on the blog where or I, I told everybody, John's mission is to make me care. Because <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't care if he and his and his wife were a, a team, a pastoral team. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really care about the other side either. It's like, look, I can put me in a room with a different group and I can argue either position really well. And mm-hmm. which, which tells me that this is probably something that's not, it, it lacks the kind of clarity that either side, you know, like thinks that, that it has, that, that there's mm-hmm. just other stuff going on here that makes mm-hmm. this really difficult. And we ought to just admit it. Mm-hmm. We ought to just, we ought to just be able to say, you know, we, we don't know. I'm not sure. And so whatever you, you believe your calling is, be blessed and, and do mm-hmm. a good job, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I would tell people like when I, I, I actually got like one interview in my life, you know, for a teaching position, Yeah. you know, and then this, this question came up and I said, I said, look, if it was my daughter, that's exactly what I would tell her. I'd say, look, I, I'm not going to, I, I just, I don't know, you know, cause I can see both sides of this, but mm-hmm. you know what, if you, if this is what the Lord wants you to do, you're convinced mm-hmm. of that, do a good job. 
Yeah. And I, and I'm going to be supportive, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to help you in any way I can. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, I, they're just things like this that, you know, I think fragment the church unnecessarily. Agreed. And, and become, they become sort of in our minds more concrete than what they actually are. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think the scripture is actually seeded with those things, not because God didn't know what he was doing, like, oh, mm -hmm. God forgot to give us this detail. But, you know, my rule of thumb is God was perfectly capable of taking this ambiguity away mm. or, or, and he, he doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if he cared, it would, it would be like this other thing over here where we're just hammered with it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear that you've had a, a good experience. I mean, I had... I did not throw my Joyce Baldwin commentaries away. Good for you. Uh, I, I, they were wonderful. Um, you know, they're part of the Tyndale series. If I could promote them any further, <laughs> but uh, you know, yeah, I, I had I, Cynthia I, Miller, you know, in grad school. Oh yeah. yeah. And she, she just, she was the reason I, 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 I had a, I had one I'm, without getting too biographical here. I had one, I had a lot of low points in, in grad school because I mean I'm working full time for 15 years and it was just the environment there. It wasn't the greatest, and she just, she was the reason I stayed in, you know. I, and I only told her that at the end of the road, you mm. know, that that you you were the reason I stayed. Yeah. So. Well, and I I probably just want to add add a comment to this discussion about women in biblical scholarship, um, just to say that there are women who still have really horrible experiences oh, yeah. in scholarship. Yep. I don't want it to sound like, hey, guys, the problem's over. Like, we're, we're where we need to be on this. I've, I've been really grateful for the encouragement I've received from men all the way through my studies. And, the, you know, they've been the ones pushing me to, to keep going on in scholarship and to teach and to write, to speak. Um, but not every woman has cheerleaders like that or mm -hmm. has that kind of a supportive community. So I think still a lot of work needs to be done, um, but I'm just grateful for the ways that, that I've had opportunities and that I've been well-received. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure I could think of stories of times when I was marginalized, but those have not been the defining feature of my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it, I, I, you're right. I mean, I can, I can think of those too. Yeah. You know, just people I've, I've known, um, you know, over the course of, of years, both in grad school and after getting out, you know. So, yeah, it does happen. It yep. does happen for really, really um, unfortunate. And I, I there are a couple I, I could think of where I would use words like ungodly, you know. Yeah, um, definitely. You know, I, I think I, I've seen a lot of change. This was my 11th uh, time attending the Evangelical Theological Society meetings. And I... I've seen a big change in 11 years. It, ETS used to be, in some ways, the highlight, and in other, in another, other ways, the biggest struggle of my academic year, mm -hmm. because that's where I would feel most acutely that not everybody wanted me there. Um, and I don't feel that in the same way anymore. I'm, I, I sense a growing support from other scholars, a uh, growing number of women involved, and I, I see a growing amount of support from the executive committee to encourage include and encourage and support women who are evangelical scholars. So, so it's been a, it, like I said, it's a good time to be in scholarship. I'm excited to see what God does. I, you know, that, that's interesting. I, I, we won't rabbit trail on it, you know, here on the, on the episode, but, you know, as, as a man, I don't even think about what the executive committee does. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so to yeah. hear you say that, I mean, to me, it, it just feels like, it just kind of is what it is and stuff happens. Yeah, you know, it's not. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm totally oblivious to that. Yeah, this is actually the first year where a woman was voted onto the nominating committee. So oh, it's the first in, in ETS's 70 plus year history where there was there is now a woman in a leadership role at the national level. It's never happened before. Wow, that's so, really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Who, is, who is that? Lynn Kohick. Oh, okay. Yeah, we know. Lynn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She was elected to the nominating committee, which, which means there there may be enough people on the nominating committee now that it's conceivable that we could have a female on the executive committee someday in the not too distant future. So that that I count as a win because again, we need we need all the voices at the table if we're to reflect the full uh, richness of of the church. 